Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of BIM Pure Live. I am your host, Nicolas Catelier. I am an architect, a BIM specialist, and the founder of Rivet Pure and BIM Pure. It is the final live episode of the season, and it is a highlight episode, our favorite moments, and I will soon introduce our guests for this evening. As usual, glancing at the chat to see what's going on. Uh, we've got... Uh, who do we have? <laughs> uh, we've got Guillaume, uh, Matthew. We've got a uh, Yogi from Melbourne, we've got David, we've got uh, Kelly, we've got Benjamin from Minneapolis, uh, Sushrut from Ottawa. So hello everybody and thanks for joining in. A quick thing to uh, mention before uh, going to our guests, uh, I'm happy to announce the upcoming course by Bimpure, yes. Rivet Pure is meant to change name fully to Bimpure. And this new course is called Herrick Families. And the goal is to help you become a Rivet Family Mega Master. For the last few years, I've worked on complex families for a wide variety of clients. And I've learned so many tricks and strategies to create advanced families. And I want to share these strategies with you. The course is going to be released in February. Uh, 2024 and you can go at this url that is in the description of this video to get on the wait list you will receive a special uh, coupon for when the course is released and you'll learn a lot it's a big course i've been working on it for the last couple of years i can see some examples of uh, case studies we'll be covering inside of this course as well as some skills you'll learn how to master arrays how to uh, control the dimensions, how to master the graphics inside your Revit families, and much more. So you can learn more about this upcoming course at bimpure.com slash heroic-families-revit, or just check the link in the video description. Extremely hyped about it. I've been working all year on this, uh, so you'll learn more in the following weeks and early next year. All right, I, I think that that's it for me. So I can, let's move straight to the guests. Hi, Jeff, and hi, Gavin. Nick, what's going on, man? Hey, thanks for accepting the invitation for this special event. Uh, we've got got more than 100 people li watching live. Um, yeah, it, this is meant to be a casual session. I've got my uh, a drink here. This is uh, called Sortilage. This is a Canadian whiskey. Oh, nice. Made with uh, maple syrup. What are you making with it? Are you just drinking it straight? Well, I actually have two options. I I tried making a cocktail. It has a little bit of apple juice hmm. and a little bit of bitters, but it's also pretty good just like this. So I just wanted to have a little taste of it. Well, cheers, man. I don't have any maple syrup, uh, <laughs> bourbon or whiskey with me. Sorry. I'm, I'm on my lunch break, so I'm drinking a, a yeah. non-alcoholic dry ginger ale. <laughs> <laughs> the boss That's okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, th typically yeah. at this time uh, of the day, like typically I do it in the afternoon, we've got the Europeans. So uh, mm. right now, no Europeans, but a lot of uh, people from Australia in the chat, as I can see. Yeah, a couple of shout outs. I see some some locals, um, Nazim and Alex and a few others. So hey, hey to all the Aussies. <laughs> Happy <laughs> Thursday to you guys, cool. right? Happy Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Happy, Happy Thursday, Thursday, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, thanks for having us on, man. It's very nice to... Um, be on a live stream and not have to focus on all the production <laughs> side of it. So I'm excited to just sit back and chat. So let you do all the hard work. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I saw some, someone mention in the, uh, in the chat, a Canadian, a Yank and an Aussie walked into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's good. <laughs> it's like a recipe for, for fun times. <laughs> all right. So I actually have a list of, of topics. I want to make sure that uh, we cover some, some of what we, uh, we've talked about. So oh let's boy. start with how was your year? Like, what's the biggest thing you worked on or accomplished, or what's the kind of a 
a highlight of the year for you? Let's oh, start with Jeff. Uh, you want me to go? Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I, I've I've actually been been wanting to start to put together a, a year in review post of some sort. So thanks for making me start to think about it. <laughs> uh, a few things. Um, you know, obviously, uh, continuing on the live stream has always been great. Um, I got a few things out the door for for Bim After Dark, the community. Um, if you guys saw recently. Um, I released the residential Revit template. Um, uh, finishing a couple of those series was big. The Modern Barn series and the, the Modern Kitchen series were, were, were a big deal. Um, and then as far as um, something that was, I guess it's not shocking, but um, what was unexpected was um, the, the Project Veris video, um, which went live um, in January or February. Uh, absolutely blew up as far as views were concerned on YouTube and whatnot. Um, and so that was that was kind of fun. Uh, it was a I was I was expecting to be interesting, interested to people, but I think it was just a timing thing. Um, and I'm actually working on an updated version because for those of you who haven't been following along, um, the team at Evolve Lab and, and Varus have have been um, updating quite a bit. Um, they've got a lot of a lot of new features. So um, that's kind of been on the, the Revit Kid slash BIM after dark side of things um, on my my day job, so to speak. Um, there's been a lot of large projects and, and new things going on, which we may be able to touch on later on in the show. So I don't have to, don't have to go go that far into it. But overall, it's been it's been great. Uh, the 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 community, the Bim After Dark community, uh, which is the the private community where all my courses um, and office hours and and sample files and templates are. Um, we're we're on the precipice of reaching our most members ever. Uh, so if if you feel like joining, head on over to community.bimafterdark.com and check it out. Um, and maybe you could be the one that pushes us over the the 200 member uh, mark. Um, so um, it's kind of kind of a little bit of the year in review there. Yeah, well, congrats for that. And I actually saw the uh, Evolve Lab in the chat. So oh. uh, sh shout who's, out to, who's, uh, who's here? To, to Bill and Ben from I don't know uh, uh, which of them is, is over there. Maybe hey, if you're watching the replay. One of them, yeah. Some of them you bought that. What's up, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've also chatted with uh, them this year. Yeah, uh, Varus was uh, pretty interesting. Definitely. All right, let, let's move on to you, Gavin. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I've had an interesting year. I've, I've been a little bit quieter on the socials and YouTube. The people might have noticed. I've taken a few months off here and there. Um, hoping to come back next year with a bit of a vengeance. Um, but for me, a lot of this year was for me was focused around learning more to how to program. Um, so not just Dynamo and Python, but really getting my teeth sunk into PyRevit, um, which I've really enjoyed the opportunity to to really just learn almost back to front. Um, but I'm also starting to learn C Sharp and uh, just raw C as well, so computer science based C, um, using a really great course from Harvard called CS50, um, and also just um, starting to play with web apps and web development as well at a very you know basic level. But starting to see that the bigger picture of software development that's available um, to us in AEC and, and beyond. Um, I definitely noticed the trends this year were moving towards, you know, probably needing to know some more computers and computer science. Um, so that's been exciting. Um, beyond the, the, the BIM and the tools, I've sort of been focusing more on just getting my life in order as well. So, um, you know, I haven't got kids yet or anything like that, but I'm sort of, uh, I'll be getting married next year. I've moved back to my home state with my partner um, and we're, we're probably looking for a house next year. So I've had to sort of put some things to the side just to, to start planning that out. Um, as I'm sure you both probably probably relate to from from those years, but uh, yeah. I think I'll, I'll come back with a vengeance next year. Yeah, I, yeah um, I think. And also, I, um, oh, I think we talked about that last year, right? Like, did you yeah, move yeah, to uh, sort of Adelaide? Was your uh, your hometown? Yeah. That was a yeah. Move. And I guess one major change too is I've, I've started working full time at the firm that I was part timing at last year as well. Um, and then you know shifting my consulting to after hours, which is you know pretty pretty tricky, but making it work um, and, and yeah, working at a, a 700 person firm um, architectus mm -hmm. in Australia. So I think we're the biggest biggest firm by headcount and probably coverage as well. So it's been a great chance to learn about just scaling solutions um, beyond you know the smaller client level that I was more used to. Um, so big challenge, but big opportunity and look forward to talking about um, what you've been up to too. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you've been there for a couple of years. Is that, is that right, Ar yeah, Architectus? Yeah. 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 So I initially worked with them on just a one day a week as a as a client, um, mm -hmm. a sub consultant, effectively, and then um, joined them part time three days a week about a year and a half ago. And I think it would have been mid last year. I was at four days and then five days at the 
beginning of this year. So um, yeah, sort of just gradually worked my way into the firm. And I work with a team of about 20 uh, BIM specialists mm. that support the 700 people at the company. So it's a really unique opportunity. Um, and it's just nice to work with, you know, a cohort of BIM enthusiasts that actually understand what I'm saying <laughs> a lot of the time, which is yeah, yeah. what we're always used to. So it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, pretty interesting. Like on my part, I'm I'm doing consulting and making working on my own. I don't have any uh, full time employees uh, working for Bin Pure. I do work with some freelancers, with some part time people, to help me on some very specific tasks. But I can see it's uh, almost two opposite words. And there's definitely pros and cons to both. Like what you're saying about working with uh, like highly specialized Bin people. That's probably pretty interesting. I, I kind of miss that. But I also do enjoy the, the freedom of working uh, by myself too, you know. Uh, yeah, on my side, so what did I do this year? Yeah, I've mentioned it while op opening the show, but I've been working really hard on transitioning the platform from Revit Pure to BIM Pure. I want to move to a subscription uh, base uh, platform. And it, it's been, yeah, it's been a big project. I thought I would be able to release it in the fall, but it it takes, uh, it, it, took way too much time it's almost uh, drove me nuts this year how long it it, it took to create uh, this website but uh, like like today i've got to announce it on live stream that it's i'm launching it uh, early next year so i'm pretty riled up about that so that was the, so definitely the, the channel, biggest piece the channel change as well or just the website well it, eventually everything is going to be uh, called uh, bim pure that's already the name of my consulting business uh it's just that it's some parts are a bit more complicated, like a blog, for example. I think we we've already talked about uh, this with Jeff. But if mm -hmm. you have a blog and there's organic traffic going to a blog, it's very hard to say, oh, suddenly we're just uh, changing the name. It doesn't really work this way. Uh, there are ways around it, but it's uh, it's kind of tricky. So I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, I have some ideas. It's possible that the, the blog will remain at Revit Pure for some time, and that the rest, everything else is going to be on, on BIM Pure. Uh, but it's still fleshing some of this out. You've got the domain, hopefully, now that you've told people that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that that's exactly why. That's exactly why my blog is still hosted on Blogspot, and everything else is somewhere else. Because <laughs> transitioning out of some of that is very challenging, especially if you have thousands of posts. It, it's a, it's not an easy process. <laughs> so I, I commend you. I know you've been working on it for a while, Nick. We've talked about it for quite some yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited to see see you get over the finish line on that one. So <laughs> yeah, like, but <laughs> for me, it was like, okay, what does a great subscription service look like? I know you've moved to uh, such a service uh, like a couple of years back, Jeff, or more than that, actually, right? Yeah, I think yeah. 2020 was the first uh, the pre the the beta the beta members of the of the um, of the community, and yeah, it was. Um, and that was, yeah, so I opened it up to, to the email list and it was whoever wanted to join in beta. And so a lot yeah, of those yeah. members are still there, which is awesome. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was it was an MVP, so it wasn't finished, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But um, it was one of those things where, and I think you and I have had this discussion, but, um, you know, when you're when you're doing something like creating courses for Revit, um, there's different approaches you can take. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I always felt was disconnected from from the people taking my courses, right? So um, this, the YouTube channel has helped, right? Having these live streams like you're doing and talking, being able to talk directly emails, people emailed me for years and we've had discussions, but um, it was always like, you know, you buy a course, you get the zip file, you download it. And what happens from there? I don't know. Right. And mm -hmm. so I wanted an, an area for, for students of the course to essentially, you know, be yeah. able to interact with me and other students. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as they work through the content, as well as an easy way for me to update content, slide in yeah. chapters, edit things without having to blast email customers for the past three years that may or may not have bought it and downloaded it, whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been an awesome transition. And, and so I'm, I'm excited for you because, you know, I, I could tell you from my experience after three years of doing it now, um, there's, you know, there's unexpected things that happen, right? It was, yeah. it was supposed to be a, just a space where I can host all of my curated content with some you know an ability to interact but slowly it's turned into um really it is a community of people and the um the office that we've had 70 we're having one on friday we've had 75 office hours and that's just a zoom call with whatever mm -hmm. members show up and so it's anywhere from three to ten members and we just chat about whatever's on their mind they might ask a specific question it may be a topic at hand um, and other members help each other and so 
it's been, you know, that part of it was completely surprise, surprising to me. So we may have members that jump in and just view courses because that's what they want to do. Maybe they just download templates and sample files. Uh, but then there's others that, you know, they're asking questions every day. They're, they're working mm-hmm. through problems. And so that to me was a, a side benefit that I, I wasn't, I mean, I guess I could have expected it, but I was, and my, my initial goal was just to make an easier place for me to manage my curated content. Yeah, yeah, I see. I and the idea of doing a MVP, minimum viable product, was <laughs> maybe something I should have done too. <laughs> I because mean, it I... Been because this was this was literally like the 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 start of the pandemic, and so it was. This was like four months into it, and I was like, I just got to get this out here. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. same thing with the live streamer. It's like these are just two things that just make sense for this moment in time, and I, and 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 so I just let's do it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah for, for me too is the idea that I'll it will be easier to release smaller kind of mini courses. Mm-hmm. Because I don't like, hey, buy this mini course about this very specific topic. I don't like having to constantly sell to people. It kind of annoys me. And so I have, I typically create courses. It takes like one year and a half, two years to create a course. And it drives me a bit crazy. It's way too long. So in the future, there's this family course that I've been working on for a while. In the future, there is, I'm going to move to more of mini courses. Mm-hmm. You know, last about one hour or something like that. Yep. And I think it's going to be more fun for me. And people like the the smaller content, I think. So yeah, that's and, definitely and, a big part of it. And as far as content creation is concerned, that is super helpful in the sense of, you know, you, I'm, I know you're like me because we've, we've known each other for a while now. And, and it's very easy to want to perfect that mm-hmm. course before you release it. And there's been times where, like, there's a, there's a topic that's hot in the community and people are asking questions and we keep talking about it. And so, you know, I'll just, I'll just say, okay, this week's office hour, we're just going to, you know, talk about, whatever it is, you know, hosting a model in ACC or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then I basically just write a couple bullet points and it's not perfectly structured, but it ends up just being basically a, a 45 minute course that's now recorded mm-hmm. in there. And then, you know, that becomes essentially another course for the community really at the end of the day. And so, you know, there's no pressure to, to, to be perfect. There's, you know, the, the people who ask questions, it's not exactly right, but at the same time, it's, yeah. it's there now and, and it's out there as opposed to me sitting there like I know you do too is for nine months planning, planning, yeah. planning, recording, editing, it, planning, and that it, kind of stuff. It's, it's a bit lonely to, to you know, to do it <laughs> yeah. this way. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's it. I think that's a good choice too because if you get firms as clients, like people don't have, you know, three days to sit down and do a course with the firm's approval. So, you know, if you have hours, like hour courses, that's much easier to sell to your boss as well if you're just trying to learn a, learn a little skill uh, i noticed too in the chat someone said twitter did the rebrand you can there you go <laughs> i see that too. <laughs> I do a lot better. i'm not I'm, yeah i was gonna say i'm not sure if that's the best example of a of a successful <laughs> rebrand considering we're all still calling it twitter right now <laughs> all, all right my the, actually i'm the, i'm changing the name to x pure there you go <laughs> bim x x bim let that sink in <laughs> uh all right i think we should move to the the, the next on the list uh do you, do you guys have any favorite apps or tools or highlights i know we've already mentioned Verus. uh anything else uh what about you gavin yeah i mean for me this this was my year of pyrevit um that app has completely got me off dynamo almost um i usually prototype in dynamo now and end up building like mini apps in pyrevit instead so an Architectus, we have a toolbar that we call Pyra, called Pyra for Architectus, which is built on top. And it's effectively about 390 little mini apps that are almost like Dynamo scripts packaged up in ribbons and buttons and all sorts of things. I can probably show it later if we want to share it, but I'm happy to do like a, an episode on it next year too, if you want. Um, but it just helps me basically consolidate all the automation smarts that we build without forcing people through the bottleneck of Dynamo Player and whoops, there's an error and you know the whole script has to run the whole way through. So it's really changed how I develop and it's also got me closer to building things like C Sharp and apps where you're sort of able to control your program um, more readily. So for me, um, that, that's been it for me. And, you know, Asan's a, an amazing developer as well. You know, he, he supports the, the the application with a few other people um, on, on the GitHub, you know, very, very, um, very carefully and very well. So it's sort of shown me what it takes to really eventually maintain software. So I've really appreciated the opportunity to, to learn more about it. Yeah. So you, you were using uh, PyRivet to build custom toolbars. That, uh, toolbars, that means that you're using uh, the Python language. So you're pretty yeah, good at, yeah. good um, enough at Python to do it entirely. Um, yeah. So like um, instead of you know having to use nodes to collect things, you have to go and use collectors in, in the API. And there's all sorts of weird techniques I've had to learn about, which are more, more how Dynamo actually works behind the scenes. But it's made me appreciate how much Dynamo does for you as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, it really does smooth the the entry point to programming so much. Um, so I think it's it's amazing to see what the team and Ian, you know, put together um, all those years ago and still are putting together. Um, but it's also, you know, helped me solve some of those compatibility and versioning challenges that Dynamo sort of brings once you go to different builds or try to run a script that can work in five versions at the same time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of great things that's offered me, yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jeff? So uh, this was a tough one. Um, I was trying to think of, you know, obviously using the same tools and some of the improvements on them. Um, I will say, um, you know, uh, Twin Motion um, had some pretty big advancements this year. Um, you know, the they, I think it was the beginning of this year now. It feels like a long time ago, but uh, they released a new UI. I believe that was the beginning of this year, um, which is very nice. And then, um, you know, in the last three months, they've introduced Lumen uh, to, to the software. Um, actually, I have it open. Maybe we should share it just to get some have some visual visual uh, dynamics to this thing here. Let me let me share. Let's see, if we, let's see if we blow you up, Nick, or not. Ready? Yeah, do it. <laughs> Let's do it. You ready to try this? Let's do it. Let's do it. <clears throat> so for those who haven't seen um, what Lumen is, can you, can you see my screen, Nick? Uh, it's, it says I uh, started sharing. Yep. Mm. Uh, maybe, like that. maybe the chat can see maybe, it. Maybe. Maybe, Lumen. <laughs> maybe Twin Motion wasn't the best one to share. Hold on. Let me, let me try one more time. <laughs> if, if, not, if not, we could talk about it. It's fine. Okay, we we like I see it's still loading. Maybe start stop sharing and try again. Yeah. Yeah, right. but okay, while that's loading, so what are your thoughts about uh, Enscape versus uh, Twin Motion? And maybe I've heard uh, more and more about its uh, D seven renders. I think they're based in China. So what do you think about all all these? Tools? Uh, D D five D five or D seven rendering? What's the one? D five. D five. D five. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I a lot of people ask me this, and um, especially because if you watch if you watch the the two the two uh, architecture series I have, the Modern Kitchen and the Modern Barn. Uh, the Modern Kitchen I'm using Enscape, and the Modern Barn I'm using Twin Motion for the visualization side of it. Um, and the truth is, um, it's actually my, I should say my answer's changing a little bit now. But the truth is, I think they both exist for for, and they both can exist, and there's no reason why you shouldn't use them both. Um, one thing Enscape has always been really good at is um, just out of the box looking incredibly good on a visual front um, as long as you're applying textures and materials in Revit um, as well as with interiors it's always been phenomenal um, and VR has also been an area where Enscape was always um, uh, just as far as um, removing the roadblocks to usage like if you know how to set up a rendering in Revit you can set up VR in Enscape right and so that that's always been huge and so um, you know, that's a piece of it. Um, until recently with the, in, with, with the addition of path tracer and lumen, um, I would say that, um, if you were doing interiors, you pretty much had to use Enscape because twin motion just didn't have the, the, the global illumination and the reflect, it just, it just, there was too much work to try and make twin motion look this, that realistic on the interiors with lumen and with path tracer, um, in both of them, to be honest, um, have kind of changed that a little bit. You can start getting interiors that are looking very similar so then the, then the only difference between them at this point in time um is 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 the real-time connection uh, which is that live sync so twin motion has it it's not nearly as clean as enscape um and then um it's also the the libraries right so you know i know people are making custom objects for enscape but i know that the process is not easy for you doing that <laughs> and so uh um you know the the between vegetation, um, you know, organic materials, the all sorts of stuff. Um, there's just an enormous amount of content uh, outside of your building and inside your building, you know, entourage and so on that you can that you have access to using Twin Motion. Whether it's the Quixel Mega Scan, Mega Scans library, which is built right in. Now they have Sketchfab built right in, or the fact that you can bring in FBX, OBJ, you know, you name it down, you know, down the list. Now even animated objects. Um, you have an endless supply of basically content that you can place in it. Um, so I guess the, the, my answer now is basically Twin Motion is free now if you have a Revit license. Um, so just whatever money you're saving on that, just buy Enscape, and then it's in, and then so you don't have to make even make a decision between the two. Right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of that's kind of where I've landed. I definitely use Twin Motion more on a daily basis, but I'm also doing a lot more large scale exterior renderings where we have tons of context, tons of, 
vegetation, all that stuff where it just doesn't make much sense to use Enscape. However, whenever I'm doing, uh, whenever I'm designing in, in Revit, um, I'm, ha I have Enscape in open in like white mode on the side all the time. Right. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I, they're both valuable to me. Um, uh, even when I'm using twin motion, it's just because of that real time connection live sync is just not as smooth as I want it to be yet. Um, and, and I'm always I'm using it, you know, I'm using the import function a little differently in the sense that there's always design options. There's always phasing and all that stuff. So you can't really use the live sync all that much. Um, so yeah, I, I, the answer to me is just use both. Right. I mean, if, I guess if you have zero budget, then you, your only answer is twin motion cause it's free. But, uh, if you're saying I paid, you know, $500 a, month, a year last year for twin motion on top of $600 a year for Enscape, then you're not paying 500 anymore for twin motion. So just use Enscape too. <laughs> yeah, I can back it up from my firm's perspective too. We we we, are, we use both, um, and you know, whilst we did look at Twin Motion and go, hey, we're technically already paying for it, uh, may as well use it. Um, we found that Enscape is just it's a much easier tool for a designer in Revit to just launch themselves into on the fly. Um, and if you regulate in Revit anyway, it makes more sense to try to, you know, not have to do much rework every time you jump into an experience. Um, but I also agree with Jeff that you know, once you do um, terrain, um, grass, things that you know yeah. uh, need a bit more detail and you know have some more assets in Twin Motion, that that makes a huge difference um, for sure. But one really good thing about Enscape is they also support Rhino, um, which is mm. one thing that we found very useful. And whilst you can run Twin Motion in standalone and still get the the information across, um, we found that the Rhino users still really love it as well. So. Yeah, I don't see it going away anytime soon, even if there are like, you know, free competitors out there technically. It's just that good of a, pl a product. Yeah, I think I think the 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 whole connection to the program is is the biggest benefit of Enscape. How it just it feels like it's it's part of, you know, Revit. Like it feels like I'm working in the same program. It's just another window within it. And that that's probably, you know, until until any of other, you know, Twin Motion, Lumion, until any of them feel like that, I think it's always gonna have a place in that process for sure yeah i have tried uh twin motion especially for some clients who ask me okay is it worth it to to pay for enscape or should we use uh, twin motion since it's free now mm -hmm. and i was surprised that uh, like it, i think the learning curve is a bit steeper than with enscape i think that's what i like about enscape how mm -hmm. you just open it and it most of right. the time it will already kind of look good they don't have yeah. to go there and tweak this and tweak that so that's what I like the most. But I think probably if you take the time to learn it more, you can get to uh, some feature you don't have access to uh, with Enscape. Yeah. Well, what's funny about it when I'm teaching when I'm teaching people either or, um, you know, with Enscape, it's it's usually if if you've ever made a rendering in Revit, if you ever hit the teapot before and made it and, and went through that process of making a native Red, Revit rendering in your history, um, then you can use Enscape because that's all you have to do, right? And so as much as that's a benefit, it's also like that also means you have to set up all your textures and materials in Revit, which some people may consider that not being a benefit, right? Because now you're dealing with the Revit material editor as far as textures, um, uh, 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 diffusion and, and, and bump maps and all that stuff. Whereas when I know I'm only using Twin Motion, I'm using Revit for basically shaded, I'm using shading on my materials with, you know, with whatever hatch patterns or surface patterns we need for the sake of graphics and even on the visuals. Um, and I'm not even touching the, the texture, the appearance tab. And to some extent, that's actually very nice because we all know that the appearance tab in Revit isn't the greatest place to be. <laughs> and so, especially when it comes to textured materials and so on and so forth. So by doing that, I, I'm bringing, you know, in, in, I'm just applying all my textures in the, the rendering program, which is twin motion in this case, and it's just a drag and drop. And, and then you're just dealing with sliders for, opacity, bump map, displacement, all these great things. And, and it's just much smoother than dealing with custom textures and all that lovely stuff in Revit. It also, one one thing we found is sometimes Enscape projects, they might open model a little bit if you're not careful because they want to see all the grout lines and the tiles and they can't mm. make the texture that looks quite right or they don't know how. Um, or someone might go and create a 300,000 piece curtain wall system to do a little louver screen that completely blows up the views every time you see it. So like that, that is a nice thing about twin motion too, that it does sort of keep the, the rendering outside the BIM platform. Cause you know, Revit's ultimately a BIM platform, not really a rendering platform at its core. Um, yeah. so that, that's, yeah, another thing you really have to be careful of using both. Yeah. yeah. And I, I also should mention that you can set up your textures in Revit and they do, they're getting better at bringing those into Twinmotion. So if you did spend the time to apply custom textures and, and materials in Revit, 
Um, ever since they switched to the data Smith exporter, um, a lot more of that stuff is coming over. Um, it's still, to my, in my opinion, it's you're, you're, I'm still replacing it with twin motion stuff because some of the properties and, and the, the realism of it may get lost in the sauce. But um, you know, you can actually you can do both. It's just I'm. I just hate the appearance tab in Revit. I don't know. It's, it's a long, <laughs> yeah. long history of, of custom material yeah, annoyance. It's, it's not good. Um, there's one more thing. I think this will probably be a transition to another topic I know you wanted to go to. I don't know if you're ready to go to AI, but... Um, yeah, it was tool. next on my list. Okay, perfect. So this is a great transition then. Another tool I did want to mention um, because um, it's more recent is um, is um, upcodes and some of the updates and the AI they built into there. So I recently um, took on a project for a friend that probably wouldn't have taken on if he wasn't a friend. And it was, it was a, a, a it's a commercial fit out within a mixed use building here here in Connecticut. And it's a um, it's a old old factory building with lots of different uses. And so it it was an area in my in that was out of my realm of expertise as far as the code is concerned. It's the international existing building code, and there's all anyone who's dealt with that. I'm sure there's lots of people in the chat who have no the frustrations of that process. And so um, uh, I took it on anyways, again, it was a friend of mine. And um, because of that, it was also an opportunity to um, to test out and use uh, the upcodes, which I've used in the past, but um, they have a tool called Copilot. Um, and so when it comes to AI, and we'll get into AI, obviously, next, um, you know, and this is me with any technology, um, I always try to, to, to look for the pragmatic, valuable real world usage of them, whether it's VR and getting past the gimmick and, and doing things like virtual inspections or or whether it's, um, uh, you know, assemble and using it for production tracking, you know, the, always trying to find like real world uses for them. And so to me, it's a brilliant idea uh, to take uh, the I'm assuming they're using chat GPT. I actually don't know what model they're using in the background. I'm just assuming it is. But basically, you know, large language learning models, you know, the, the, the essentially what chat GPT is. Um, but it's basically just the entire, I mean, Upcodes already has essentially the entire database of building codes in there in, internally, right? So it's just a matter of, of feeding the AI that information and then it's working the same as ChatGPT. Um, and so uh, this thing has been absolutely uh, invaluable or, or it's, it's been extremely valuable for me within this process of using it. And I could actually show for anyone who hasn't seen, I do have it open. So let's see, maybe this will work when I share. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Do you guys see this? Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, okay, so it must have been twin motion. Maybe it was just a graphics thing that was going on. I did have Lumen turned on, so I might. It might have just been some weird Zoom, Zoom, and 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 any of these programs. By the way, if you guys haven't shared Enscape Lumion or or Twin Motion with Zoom, there's always issues. But um, you have to pay a little more for this. It's not your basic Upcodes um, subscription, so you you do have to pay a little more for it. But when you start to see how it works, it's 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 pretty impressive. So you can see here, it's called Copilot. And if I go in here, um, I can search codes and diagrams or assemblies. And so if I can search codes and diagrams of current year, if you want to dig in a little more, you can. But here you can talk to it just like you talk to ChatGPT. But the really neat thing about it, so if I say, um, how wide does a corridor need to be in a mixed use project with A3 occupancy or something, I don't know, whatever. Uh, just like anything uh, with with AI, you start to understand how the prompting needs to be. Um, so I'm just making something up here. But what's incredible is it's now it's it's parsing the entire database they have with your filters within it, and then it's giving you a response. But what's really great about it, and I'll show you once the response is done, um, is it also cites everything that it's parsing, and then you can jump to those to those pieces, right? So you can see here what it's doing is you know uh, the width of a corridor in a mixed use project with A3 occupancy, such as a gallery or bowling alley. Will be subject to regulations outlined and blah blah. It's also state building codes as well. Um, and then what's really neat down here is it's showing you the reference sections within the results, and then you can jump to those. So if it's talking about a specific section here, then you can jump to those, and it also will show you the diagrams that might relate to that answer. Um, so as far as like the pass, which upcodes is valuable for just being able to use it as like a search engine. Now you're able to sort of ask it questions and then follow up questions, right? And you can see here what it's saying is to provide more detailed, accurate information, we need specific details such as occupant load, blah, 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 blah. And then you could respond with, you know, 130 people, 12, whatever, and you go down the list and it starts continuing on. Um, obviously, you need to still use your brain and your experience with codes, but uh, it's it's just such a time saver for the other than, you know, the, the old process, which... Again, upcodes is great at where you search something, you click it. I usually would bookmark it, search again, move around, and you're kind of like doing flipping back and forth. 
Um, but you know, within this, you can see now it's also showing the sections and I can open those in, in a new tab and then it jumps to the actual building code section. And then from there, you can dig back and forth. And so I, I, I don't remember what it is a month. It's like 40, 50, 60 a month. It's actually fairly expensive. But if you're someone who's constantly searching code uh, database or searching building code databases, and that's that's a lot of your type of work you do, you know, my the work I do, um, you know, uh, on the residential side, usually I'm not I'm not doing this very much at all. But but uh, so, so for me, it was useful here, but I can't imagine or I can't imagine that being extremely valuable for someone who's consistently digging through the codes and, and going through it. So a super great use for what we see as like chat GPT and all the gimmicks of like ordering pizza or whatever. Um, that's like a real world. This is awesome. Feed it a whole bunch of data and then let that thing do all the work. And uh, Upcode, is that a platform for uh, code analysis in the US? So it's a, um, it's a, a platform that has, uh, it's not code analysis. It's, all of the building codes are yeah. there. Like it's the so it's got. Um, Is there the Canadian uh, code? Or <laughs> uh, I actually don't know. Let's see. Filter, filter by. Because I never use this. That's the problem. Well, what, you is know, I, what does Canada I, use? Is it, is it IBC with the Canada like? It, it depends on, it on the province. You know, if there's a Canadian yeah. code, then each province kind of has its yeah. own uh, local code with some modification. I actually tried so, ChatGPT with uh, for code analysis yeah. to see what would happens, and it. It gave me answers for the from the U.S. code, so it was all yeah, confused. Yeah. It looks like it's mostly U.S. with the states yeah. and the, within it. Um, there's there's Department yeah, of Defense, sense. there's some DoD ones, um, which you know most of the U.S. codes are based on IBC as well, but obviously uh -huh. it's with you know with with all the the local the local stuff in place. So no, it looks like it looks like a U.S. Maybe there's yeah. a national one. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, in terms, but it's super cool. In terms, you know, I think I realized I didn't answer the, my favorite app or tool of the year. I guess oh, yeah, I have yeah, two. Yeah, do that before we move on. <laughs> uh, if first, I, I would say, I'm not sure if it's my app of the year, but it's certainly a shout out of the year. It's uh, Speckle. Are you guys familiar with mm. Speckle? I, I think it's the, I like their approach. Basically, maybe they won't say it publicly, but from what I understand, they don't like the IFC format and they think the future of uh, connectivity between different apps is to go to a web portal and push the data to the web. And I've played, uh, I've been on a project where there was a developer that uh, managed to use large language uh, model, so basically chat GPT, where you could talk mm. or ask questions like acquire this quantity of woods uh, mm. and searching in the Revit model from the properties and was able to acquire without having to kind of program and acquire each individual parameter. So it's pretty impressive. And I like the fact that you can have uh, program on, on Speckle and it can work with data from Revit, can work with data from Rhino. And I think even Autodesk are pretty impressed with it. And uh, they've launched recently or, or announced it's Autodesk Data Exchange, something like that. So it's basically, it's extremely similar to us uh, to Speckle. It's on mm -hmm. uh, data that you bring on the web portal. Mm -hmm. And okay, so that's one thing. And the second app of the year, probably ChatGPT. I've used it a lot and for, for some surprising uses. For example, uh, you know, I use InDesign for page layouts for all the PDFs I create, and I wanted to update the layouts of 30 PDFs, and I was like, oh, man, that's, that's gonna be boring. So I asked ChatGPT, is there a way that I could, you know, create it to use JavaScript? Like, can you write JavaScript to do this task? And I describe what I wanted, and I've tried it. I think I had to fix a couple of things, but it worked, and it saved me so many, so much boring time. Same thing for web development. I had a page where I wanted uh, a feature where people could enter, let's say I want to train 20 users and the price updates. And I've I've talked to a few experts and told me, nah, it's probably complicated. You'll have to hire a developer to do it. And uh, ChatGPT just did it for me. It, it just worked. It was pretty amazing. And there's, yeah, there's plenty of uses. Uh, so yeah, that's my two apps of the year. And it leads to the topic of uh, AI. <laughs> so... Yeah. Uh, what about you, Gavin, on your on your side when it comes to uh, uh, yeah. AI? What do you yeah. think about it? I mean, it's it's going to be like Google, right? One day we'll be looking back on it, going, "It's just such a natural thing to use." Um, you know, when Google first showed up, everyone went, "This is weird. I don't know how to use it." And now we just it's like Twitter. You, you Google it. It's a, it's a verb. Um, eventually, you know, AI is just going to become such an understood and appreciated component what we do for now there's a lot of ai actually behind the scenes and has been for a long time but people haven't really understood it at a public level um or just a, a, a user level so i think that's um you know just naturally gonna ramp up um but i guess like like 
opcodes sort of showed us, you know, you need a very specific AI to solve a very specific problem, um, which is where I think the challenges will come about, especially in architecture specifically, um, in that we are dealing with very multifaceted problems um, that bring a lot of things together. So if we need to solve a multifaceted problem, we probably need a multifaceted AI solution as well. Um, so the general solutions might not be enough, um, but then who will develop the multifaceted AI, I guess, will it become an app store of specific AIs that know how to work together or, you know, will we all be paying for six AI models, you know, $300 a month per user might, might be scary. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, how long can you afford to not use it is the other question as a business. Um, you know, what's your churn? What's your burn? Mm. At the end of the day, you know, I, I use the analogy a lot that, you know, it's sort of like people having to choose a building to climb up. And some of those buildings are going to catch on fire one day because <laughs> they pick the wrong building and they're just going to have to keep climbing and hope the building keeps going. But eventually, you know, those buildings run out and businesses won't, won't survive. But, um, you know, if you pick the right building, you plan it out, you do a bit of research, you can hopefully keep up with all this crazy technology that's hitting the market. Yeah, yeah I think with AI, there's some amazing things about it, but there's some darker aspects. And like many, one of them is just the overhype in terms of marketing, like on social media, like this new AI tool. Every day, it seems like this is the next tool. This is the AI that's going to change your life uh, for the industry. And it's yeah. it's been hard to keep up, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's been hard to... everything is AI, right? Like everything is yeah. called AI now, even if it's not, just because yeah. that's what they need to say to get people's attention. So... Uh, uh, Autodesk like... AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like some things I see and I'm like, that's just a big logic tree that's barely AI. Yeah. Like I could write an AI by that logic and, you know, get it to figure out what to make for breakfast every morning if I worked hard enough at it. But but um, I guess behind the scenes, you know, it's all ones and zeros too when you get right down to the bottom of computers and what they're doing. So, you know, at a point we run the risk that we no longer understand our tools and how to inform mm -hmm. them, how they're informed. There's a bit of a muddy area in AI, you know, if we stop writing articles about how to do things, what's AI going to learn, you know, because we're using AI, why write an article, just go to the AI, eventually you hit a, a zenith of knowledge, I guess, too, there's a lot of risks there, but it's, it's an exciting topic to talk about, very dystopian sometimes, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> definitely could be dystopian. I think um, what, what, what you're mentioning, Nick, is, you know, that hype about it, I think that that's kind of why the co-pilot thing uh, on, on upcodes, um, it was exciting to me, because um, that to me, I mean, you think about it it's the same with, um, you know, Bitcoin and NFTs, you know, two, three years ago or three, three, four years ago, whatever it was, right. There's this huge hype, huge hype. And then, and then it kind of, you know, dulled out, but at the same time, you know, the heart of the technology and the utilization, like that's the part that's going to live on. Right. So, you know, even though a, a million of the, the, the cryptocurrencies trashed, right. The concept behind them the block the blockchain behind them right is the utility that's going to be is it groundbreaking right and same thing with chat gpt right it's it's the hype is around chat gpt and what it does and, and and you know all these things that you're talking about um but to me it's the the technology behind it and how that's going to be useful and that's the upcodes is a great example of it right it's 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 you got to think beyond like the you know think beyond beanie babies and think about stuffed animals right it's kind of like you got you got you know the 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 value add in the future and what it's going to do for all of us is is going to be that and that's why even like you know people are just like whatever or they're scared of it i i, I say just just like go on and try it because the, at a minimum what you want to do is understand like how how to prompt how to talk to these things and how to because whatever it looks like in five years that's going to be an essential skill is 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 you know how do you talk to ai how do you interact with it is going to probably be the biggest skill moving forward because like like you're saying gavin right it's at, at the end of the day 99 percent of people don't care about what's happening on the back end right it's it's you know we do because we're techie geeks and then that's what we get into but at the end of the day like the 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 skill of it is and the, and the or the how we utilize it is, is what I'm, I'm most excited for. Um, so yeah, I'll get into it because I'm, I'm a geek like that. And I want to try these things early on and, and, and really dive into to new tech when it comes out. But at the same time, it's like, what's, where's the use case going to be and what's it going to look like and how is, which part of this is the utilization, right? Blockchain is a great example. That hype has kind of died down. The, the cryptocurrency hype has kind of died down, but guess what? Blockchain is going to be because of AI, blockchain is probably going to be massively valuable in a couple of years because you know <laughs> the more deep fake videos we see and the more the more ridiculous fake stuff we're seeing created by ai 
the only way we're going to be able to validate this stuff is a technology like blockchain. And so when you start tying those together, you're like, okay, okay. And so, you know, then that, you know, that's one example for deep fakes, but then, you know, well, how do we, you know, how do we certify our, our, our documents for projects? How do we, you know, like, and, and then you think about it in the AEC industry and it's, it's all the same idea. It's less about the front end hype and more about the underlying utilities and how those all work together. And that is what's going to be groundbreaking, you know, for the next five to 10, it, it'll get, it'll be off of NBC and, and all the news channels, right. In a few years. Um, but the underlying technology is going to be part of our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like it, to me, the surprising thing is, you know, how fast everything changed. And it's, I don't know if you guys remember, but when there was the first, it was a Dali mini that mm -hmm. you could generate almost these meme images. Mm -hmm. Like it was yep. haha, like, <laughs> look at these funny images generating and like, like four months later, it's like the most hyper realistic. It's like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> Why? Yeah. How fast How has, yeah, has that been? Let me just look. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now, and now it's in it's in Chat GPT. If you have if you pay for a Pro, yeah, and four, and it is wildly awesome. Like it is just, <laughs> it is awesome. Yeah, I, I did use it, and for ex and it's changing so fast. For example, some people people were saying, well, prompt engineering for mid journey is going to be a big thing. It's mm -hmm. going to be huge scales. But for example, with Dali, you can actually just type in natural language for what you want mm -hmm. instead of having these kind of scientific prompts and you need to type this specific thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's almost like, well, maybe the, the prompt engineering thing is it won't actually be a thing or it's learning to outstock to the AI is going to be a thing. But this prompt uh, craft, that especially that you had to use with Midjourney, yeah. maybe not so relevant in the future. I think prompt engineering will become abstracted, as we say in computer science, yeah. where you sort of put a layer between the user and the software that does something in yeah, between. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it will use semantics or common trends of what people approve or disprove of using certain words and associating them with deeper prompts, and that might be the destination of it. Because I know that you know you, you watch your parents try to Google something; it's 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 yeah, ghastly, right. and you know AI is the same. <laughs> Unless they know exactly how to use it, they're going to get nothing they need, but Google's got better at working with really bad searches uh, through yeah. learning just what people go to from those searches. So I think that'll be the, the pathway that sort of connects them. Yeah, but yeah. even Google, it doesn't work as well as it once did, or maybe it's just I'm used to ChatGPT for certain topics. Like let's say that I'm comparing two software, two similar software that I want to use. If you, I mm -hmm. Google, the two first results are going to be web page on, on the app itself, you know? Right. So it's kind yeah. of branded topics it's like well mm -hmm. i want something more neutral so i actually end up asking ChatGPT, what do you think about these uh two tools <laughs> of course it depends like turn on, it's not turn, on um, <laughs> turn on project bear bard 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 i'm not sure what it is Bard's. but that's, Go oh, that's yeah. google's google's chat gpt is okay yeah their yeah. ai tool and so if you i think you can sign up for the beta but so now when i google the first the top of the page is is, an, is essentially an AI response sort of thing, and there's it's sort of, it's sort of like built into it, and then the rest is like the, your typical Google search thing. So then you can kind of get the best of both worlds in there. It's starting to, you know, and that's what it is, right? It's starting to, it, it like that was Gavin that makes complete sense, right? It's gonna, the future isn't gonna be you know prompt engineering, like understanding the exact syntax that AI mm -hmm. wants, right? It's 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 gonna it's modify. Gonna in fact, I was literally just reading an article probably two days ago, and I don't remember what university it was. I wish I could. I'll, I'll probably find it up. But it's a study, and they were they were having AI generate images through brain brainwaves. So they had people were thinking of <laughs> images, and 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 they, it was like scary. seventy. It was like seventy two percent accuracy from what they were thinking or what they were seeing. I don't remember what it, what it was. If they were seeing the image and it was recreating it, or if they were thinking about the image, and that's crazy when you think about it. So now you don't even need to worry about typing it anymore. You just think it, and 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 you know it'll it'll do its thing. So pretty pretty cool though. Actually, if you just sat there staring at your computer and like draw a wall thirty feet, you just thinking about it and Revit's just doing it, that'd be nice. <laughs> you think about it. Oh yeah, my God. Yeah, yeah. We'd all, all the carpal tunnel syndrome would be gone, right? <laughs> you raise an interesting point there. I mean, like Revit, is it really going to be like the program driven by the AI? Is it even capable of it ultimately? Or because the amount of work you have to do to get an old program to work with new ideas is just, it's just a heap of code basically behind the scenes. Right. Um, so I wonder if, you know, Autodesk AI, those sorts of movements will lead to, I mean, probably an acquisition, let's be honest, but, um, yeah. you know, they'll lead to something that is more naturally attuned to this way of thinking and working and directing a program. Um, mm -hmm. Because behind the scenes, the Revit API, you know, you've got to do a lot of legwork to even make it think right. like a person, <laughs> as we know, building apps, it's not an intuitive process. Um, so yeah, I wonder. <laughs> and if... how do you deal with all the warnings, right? And 
Oh, yeah. yeah, AI would have no idea what to do with one of those. Yeah, we don't like, know what to do, right, right. It parts not human, you have 700 warnings, human. what would you like me to do? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I'd be interested to see if, if, you know, the programs of today really do last into the future of AI or if they become yeah. a bit of a relic that, you know, people hang on to because it's how they work. Mm -hmm. um, be exciting to see what happens. Oh, God, someone just said, love my Revit railings. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I've noticed off the railings. I've, I've noticed, and I, I didn't go to AU this year, but I've noticed coming out of it and listening to some of the Autodesk folks speak afterwards. There's been a lot of chat about um, ACC and and Forge and the platform, and and it 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 being an information hub and and uh, and and sort of this centralized place, and, and and you know you can see what they're trying to do with some of the app stuff. So I think I think that is you could tell that I mean you know call it what it is and it's still Autodesk that there's a lot of smart people there and they uh you know I, I think what you're saying Gavin is probably right and, and so you know my guess is that yeah in who knows how many years but you know the platform we're doing BIM in whatever it looks like then um is probably going to be cloud-based on some platform like that and it's going to the back end of it is going to be nothing like the core structure of what we see in CAD or Revit you know but at the same time, I mean, um, you look at the number of Forge developers versus Dynamo developers out there, it's a staggering difference. I wonder if there's going to be a need for Autodesk to become uh, more service focused over product focused um, if they wish mm -hmm. to really bring firms to, to the table um, yeah. or if they just select five or six firms that have, you know, the, the top of the top developers that can keep up mm -hmm. with this. Because um, I think there's a, there's a huge difference in yep. the type of development that we do in Rabbit currently versus where it might potentially go. But it's exciting. It'll lead to new jobs and new opportunities and probably transform a lot of BIM managers. So it should be exciting. Yeah, like I'm, I'm more wondering about where the industry is going to go, but it, it feels like everything is, is changing. The apps are all going to change. But at the same time, and just about think about how long it was to transition from a CAD to Revit. You know, some firms just stuck to Revit, uh, to to CAD for a while. And so I'm still, so I'm still, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm wondering, <laughs> is are we gonna see like twenty percent or early adopters, like in the next five years, move on to completely different platforms, and like the rest is gonna follow, or everything is gonna move much faster because of AI and what at the speed of the development of new apps, because it feels like they've, I've never seen so many startups in AAC than I, mm -hmm. I did in the last couple of years. It's pretty crazy, uh, mm -hmm. the, the amount of development, but st it, Rivet's still sitting at the top right now. Uh, so I'm really uh, wondering what's gonna happen with that app. Like from what I understand, I had a chat with Martin Day of AAC Magazine, mm -hmm. but what seems to, to be going on is that Autodesk are watching, uh, the new apps being developed and they, they might acquire one of them. Like Snaptrude seems to be the one most advanced currently because Autodesk are not very good at building new apps from scratch. They're good at acquiring them and selling them and putting the platform, the cloud platform around it. That's what they're good at. So that's, I think that's what we might see in the future with them. Oh yeah, I don't think they're gonna develop it by themselves. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, yeah not it's all. almost it's got almost yeah the huge boat and it's you know it's slow to move around and it's uh, they're not fast and agile enough like to build uh, uh, the next generation app that people actually want to use. Yeah, well that's okay. I mean, you need to bring users with you to some degree. I mean, we've seen Forma, for example, um, which you know shows some promise, but at the same time, a lot of these programs are still in very infant stages that they're, they're what I would call feasibility tools a lot of the time you know where it's like we've been doing this in Rhino for years but now yes it's on the web yes it's going to have integrations big changes um so maybe these might be the future app maybe they won't it's a it's a very speculative time from a software perspective I think and yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I agree with Martin on a lot of what he says about this too that you know we're really only just seeing the the ideation phase of a lot of these big changes at the moment um, but there's definitely some key players in the market to watch. I mean, Hyper has always been one that I've had my eye on because yeah, they're, that's right, they're yeah. saying the right things. They've got the right people um, and they're just trying to get the right people to use it now, I think is their, their next step. Yeah. Yeah, Hyper definitely. So, okay, we've talked um, about some AI. What's so interesting, fascinating about AI is like there's like ChatGPT programming on one corner, then there's the image generation, then there's a 3D modeling generation as well. Uh, one of the chat I had was with uh, Tim Fu, uh, formerly from Zahadid, and he's, 
exploring the journey, but also platform like LookX made specifically for architecture. So mm -hmm. there's I love that episode. He had such yeah. a refreshing, honest take on AI, yeah, yeah. which is pretty rare on podcasts these days. So I really commend that that discussion was very honest and open. It's a great episode. Yeah, definitely, especially his ideas on copyrights, which is goes against the grain of what you typically hear. So I've never heard basically things that copyrights the idea that if you type, uh, I want a building in the style of Zaha Hadid, it's not a big deal, you know, and it's not a problem, which typically I've heard the other side of the argument, which saying it's a big problem. But for him, his thought was, if you want the architecture and technology to advance, you must not be too careful about that. You know, you accept it's part of the culture. But I guess uh, if you look at art, the thing I enjoy is like, if someone has a recreation of a painting, it doesn't usually impress anyone. Um, it's yeah, more about right. yeah. the people that did it a lot of the time. So if you say this building was designed by someone that prompted an AI to do Zaha he did, they're going to go, well, that sounds really lame. Um, so sometimes there is that degree <laughs> of prestige that comes from the, the top of the top yes. and what they're chasing. So I wonder if that yeah, definitely so. be the reason why it can't change, even if it's a very vain reason. Um, I guess it's, you know, it's the reason why not everyone goes to five or two, cause you don't actually get so I did to work on it. Like as a firm with you, <laughs> you get, you know, the, the firm down the road that knows how to talk to an AI, I guess. So you don't get the service, everything that comes with it. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's almost, uh, 10 PM here. Can you be uh, 9 PM? Sorry. Can you believe it? So <laughs> let's move through a couple of more topics. If you have a little bit more time, of course. Yeah, sure. uh, one of them was general highlights of the year in BIM AC. I guess that was, you know, similar to the first topic was uh, the the biggest things. So any specific highlights in apart from the, these apps? Yeah, I mean, mine was definitely the NXT BLD or Next Build conference that Martin organized. Um, I really enjoyed the discussions that came out of that. And I think there was a lot of really honest, candid, um, and not necessarily all optimistic discussion around what's happening, but it was the right people in the industry coming together to say, hey, let's actually, you know, talk in the open and show people what we all think before it, before it's here, I guess. Um, and just seeing that that movement as well as a sort of a positive push towards, you know, asking us, you know, where are we going as an industry? True change comes from within. I liked that. Yeah, that was my highlight. I, I did put the link to the next bill conference. So this was... Uh organized by Martin Day of AC Magazine. And it feature, uh, I think it's held in London and it's with speaker from various uh, architecture firms and software developer, pretty interesting. I actually got inspiration to invite <laughs> a few of these guests on, on the show in, in the fall season. Uh, what about you, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think we've, we've talked about a lot of stuff uh, which probably falls under this category. I think if I, if I zoomed in a little more in, in the micro um, of, of, of what I'm doing. So for those that don't know, um, so I'm an architect. Um, I'm also the Revit kid and I do all the all that stuff um, online. Um, but my my day job is um, at a large construction management company um, here in Connecticut. And it's also a national um, construction management company. So I, I get I get to see perspectives, you know, from from foremen and tradesmen, you know, working and actually doing the work all the way up to you know, owners and, and star architects, you know, designing, designing the work and kind of get to see all the sides of it. And there, there's definitely, um, there's definitely been um, a shift in, in the mindset of, of model usage and, and an interest in it um, from, from lots of parties uh, over the last probably 12 to 24 months. Um, that, that is exciting, uh, honestly. And, and, and what I mean by that is like, even, even owners, um, you know, the, they're asking, better questions and, and than just what they heard at a conference type of thing right and and the rfps are are, are getting more um uh complex in, in the the usage of models as well as the, and they clearly are starting to see the value in that process which in turn is starting to push the a side of aec a little bit too um the a and e side i should say um as well which is which is nice um and then also on the on the construction side of it too, um, you know, and I think part of that is is because of all the stuff we've just been talking about. It's the the um, these the advancement of these tools, all the startups you're talking about, the different various. And personally, like like you know what 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 we keep talking about within my group here in, in New England is we call it and we call it the democratization of BIM, and it's because of these cloud apps like you know ACC or you know you name your cloud app that gives you access to to this information, um, you know, it's, it no longer requires, you know, a, a 
a Bimbox laptop to access a, a federated, you know, three hundred million dollar mm. hospital building, right? And 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 that is, it, it, I, I can literally do it on my phone. I can do it on an iPad. I can do it on a a, a little, you know, a Dell Precision. And and so when you think about that, and that really only is what two to three years old. When you think about the actual, um, you know, scaled rollout of a tool like ACC or BIM three sixty to the point where you you don't require that hardware either on that side. And so that's opening the doors for um, way more model centric approaches to construction. And so, you know, in those startups, you're seeing them, right? You, you see the robotic layout startups, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing all on the construction side, you're starting to see taking advantage of that. You know, there's you know, Howick machines where they're printing studs based on the model, there's you know, different layout tools, there's all these different things going on. And so that that to me has been, um, and that's something that I've been pushing within my team and within within the company is is that it's it's, I think we're at a moment where the technology is finally caught up to all the stuff that you and I have, and and all of us have been talking about for ten years of the value and the usage of this model to the point where we're starting to challenge the contracts and 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 what those are saying, um, and and challenge the 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 scapegoat of using the contract to to not access this valued information and so. To me, that's the most, it's not necessarily a single platform or tool. I guess to some extent, ACC is part of it. I don't necessarily want to lean all on ACC, but 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 that's a huge, I've noticed a giant shift in that. And 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 it's also sort of a tipping point where, um, you know, it's, you can start asking these things and asking for these things because they are possible now. It's 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 available to, to everybody. And that, that to me is massive. Yeah, I can definitely back that up in Australia. Um, but we're seeing clients actually give us BIM management plans to review more often than not, which is great. I'm like, yeah, I don't have to write one, but to me, the <laughs> client tells me what they want. <laughs> I mean, amazing, right? Like I say, yeah. yeah, it's good to see owners and clients and then contractors too, really, um, you know, telling people what they need um, rather than asking us to explain BIM and, you know, get a set of drawings and off they go. So yeah, great, great, great on highlight. Yeah, so do, do you get good uh beam requirements from clients it's this has been a, a big challenge because often we i see what i see and jens from big actually had a talk about this at the next bill conference mm -hmm. of the overabundance of uh, bureaucracy and norms and complicated standards deliverable that architects mm -hmm. is almost impossible to deliver or takes mm -hmm. so much time to just to change make these changes so what is it like in australia do you get decent oh, it's good definitely a conversation like it's never just like <laughs> yes agreed um yeah. <laughs> there's got to be a prioritization of like hey you know you just asked for more than what the team can realistically do yeah, in the yeah. project's life life cycle and also like do you really think your contractor is going to be able to do all that stuff too often the contractors are really time time poor as well um due to programming often so uh, we have to have a very deep conversation typically um where we realistically usually bucket things and say these are the things where they're, they're absolutely essential to the project they have to happen we agree these are things where it's like yep then they're, they're nice to have but this is what they actually are now that you know do you really want them and then the, we suspect you just copied this from the last bmp and it's probably not relevant to the project sort of thing so like you know cloud servers on defense projects i'm like you sure about that like you know there's some really obvious copy and paste sometimes but yeah, just really prioritizing what the client understands and what they've asked for is always always necessary because you know people only have so much time to write and read those documents as well <laughs> so i understand why it happens yeah uh all right it's uh the time is flying i think we should, should move on uh one of the questions i had is there a specific uh, person that you discovered this year whose work you, you discovered or that you really enjoyed in the ac and, and bim like for, for me, I think I mentioned a couple of them. It's typically I invite them to the live show. <laughs> That's what's so nice about having a live show. When they see something interesting, I can invite them and discuss, which is amazing. So uh, any and Jeff, you have a, a live show too, so you also <laughs> have you can also do it. So any yes. kind of really highlights of some uh, someone whose work has blown your mind this year? Wanted to give a shout out. Uh, so or, or, yeah, I don't. I don't want to. This isn't. So this person isn't known for BIM or AC tech or anything like that, but um, it's it's somebody that I've been using the concepts and the and 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 his 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 approach to I think is I think he's technically like a business strategist, but anyway, his, his name is Simon Sinek Sinek S I N E K, um, and so he's a speaker, he has books and all that good stuff, um, and and so if you check those out, but I think um, where 
where it, where what he says relates to us is there's a lot about cultural transformation and 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 uh, and people's you know getting down to people's you know why they do things why we're going for this and it's it's been very helpful for me um in the sense of um uh you know what i was just talking about where um you know <laughs> we're we're at a point where we can start having a more model centric construction process but you're you're trying to change the culture of of people who have to have been constructing buildings for the same way for 30 years right and and so there's this this you know a lot of great ideas so, so if you're in a firm that's it's transitioning to BIM or you're trying to 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 um, roll out or, or I don't say roll out as necessary, but you're trying to change the culture of 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 your company or or what people are doing or you know and, and it completely relates to technology. Um, then I've been his his stuff has been really eye opening um, in a sense of uh, how I've been approaching presentations about it, um, meetings and, and initiatives and all that good stuff. Um, and it's it's actually it's it's very challenging for large corporations to 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 latch on to this because they're so used to um, reading you know the, the 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 corporate structure of how things go and this is very much um, soft skills type of stuff right it's beyond it so that's somebody that I discovered this year and, and has really really helped um, you know a lot of my day job stuff but it is it's even enforced some of the some of the speaking the speaking arrangements I, I did a I did an AIA presentation here in Connecticut um, at the at the local conference the Connecticut conference and uh, it, the title of it was and remember this is a room full of architects the title of the presentation was your bim should be a contract document and here's why <laughs> so, so you can imagine like what reaction did you get <laughs> it was it was it was surprisingly yeah. positive but again i yeah. the the i took a lot from how how you know the the style or the the ideas that um, this guy simon has put forth to to on how to actually approach that topic right because you know it's not you know that was obviously a meant to be a little bit of a controversial topic or a, a title um, but the the theme of it was what I was just talking about, which is we're at a pivotal moment in time, in my opinion, based on technology and what we're doing and what we're seeing, and and you know we can't do it alone, right? Like like uh, I'm speaking as a contractor in this one. I'm like the you know there's there's three parties involved here. There's multiple parties involved, and so um, that was been you know that that's been huge for me this year. All right, I just put the the name of the chat. Uh, yes. Simon Sinek, and is yes. there a book or? Uh, yeah, so he's got he's got a book called um, "Find start, Your Why" or something about your why. Start um, with why. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, start with why. Um, okay. And then there's a few TED talks that I 100 suggest you guys. There's okay. There's one. There's one called the law of in the law of diffusion of innovation. If you mm -hmm. watch that, um, it's for everyone on here. I'm sure you guys are absolutely going to love it. Um, it's it's really cool. <laughs> I like Check it. All right, something you on my reading list. Or... There you go. <laughs> uh, what about you, Gavin? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Jeff. Simon's a great presenter. I've seen some of his TED talks before, and he's mm. he's, he's got a great way to connect to his audience. Um, but for me, probably probably the person that I probably listened to the most this year um, during at least educated moments was a guy called David J. Milan, who runs the CS50 project at Harvard. Um, and he, he they literally share their lectures on stage, and you get to see exactly his teaching methods. And I mean, he taught me how a computer works, basically. That was one cool thing about it. But I got to see some new teaching ideas and techniques of how to make your education more engaging. Um, so he actually gets people physically involved with exercises and examples and whilst, you know, on teams, you can't do that. Um, what, what's the name? Sorry, I'm, I'm Googling it. David James? Yeah, Dave, David J. Malan, M-A-L-A-N. He, he basically runs the whole computer science um, faculty at Harvard. Um, but um, okay. yeah, he, he, just, um, he just taught me different ways, body language techniques. I, I just watched how he presented and went, you know what, this, this person is an engaging presenter and has sort of, sort of taught me to look back and reflect on my own sort of styles of engaging people because programming is hard. It's hard to engage people with it sometimes. And programming, kind of Revit, it. BIM, these are all, uh, it's, it's very challenging to make this content uh, <laughs> as, as exciting. It's also just as, like yeah. building on concepts. So starting people at like a base level, but getting yeah. them beyond it, it's such a challenge. So mm -hmm. I sort of almost like watched how he was teaching people about CS yeah. as well, computer science. And I think it's going to give me a few fun little tricks and techniques, hopefully next year when I jump back into Hi Revit and beyond. Um, but yeah, I think that was the, probably the person that inspired me the most from, from just my time with him on a screen, which I wish was in person, but I'm um, still amazing that the course is free and you can, you can just do it. So highly recommend it too to anyone that wants to learn more about computer science. It's a pretty intense course. Like you do have to learn C 
and do exercises and get graded by a computer. <laughs> the, the people don't grade you. <laughs> you submit mm -hmm. your answers to a, a program. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, and I think you asked about media or books or something like that as well. Or like, uh, yeah, that's what, yeah, we can go right there. Like I had a question, oh, yeah, yeah, which sure. is Sorry. more uh, <laughs> general uh, favorite TV show, hobbies, movies, music, podcasts, mm -hmm. book, board games. Uh, anything yeah. you don't have to pick one for each just a couple of highlights yeah definitely got two for me um i mean tv show i've, I've been watching doctor who um the, the new food of it i'd only watched old, old doctor who before and I've, i think i'm up to season nine at the moment i've just been binging that whenever i have free time um really enjoyed that i'm, I'm a bit of a nerd so it's definitely my sort of show <laughs> um and movie for me was a surprising one i i actually thought the barbie movie was really good um, really enjoyed it. And uh, I went with my partner who's, who's female and, and it sort of, you know, was nice to see a, a movie that, you know, women could relate to with like a flawed but developing role model, not a Mary Sue that, you know, Star Wars and those sort of things throw out. And she really appreciated it. So it gave me a, a nice perspective and I, I found it a really funny movie as well. Ryan Gosling just smashed out of the park. It was hilarious. And my girl Robbie did a really good job too. So they're my two sort of media highlights. Yeah, Barbie was pretty good. I think I really enjoyed the Mario movie. I went to see it yeah, uh, yeah, the theater yeah. with uh, both my daughters, and it just laughed the whole way through. So it's pretty it's nice to I experience movies uh, with my kids now, and I, so I I've not that it changed my taste, but I think I enjoyed the movie more because I could see how much they were enjoying it, and I thought it yeah. was pretty well made. Uh, yeah, Barbie was good. Oppenheimer was pre pretty good as well. Uh, what do you think, Jeff? Did you, um, did you do the Barbenheimer or did you the, watch one? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, uh, not to, uh, yeah, like I didn't go to Oppenheimer with my uh, daughters, though. So <laughs> I <laughs> a bit scarier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I went with a couple of friends. Yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't. I mean, the only movies, yeah, the only movies I watch these days are kids' movies. So I, I think the last <laughs> time I went to the movies was the Paw Patrol movie that just came out. Um, so I haven't watched too many. The as far as series or shows. Um, I did I did latch on to the craze and, and watched all of the seasons of Suits, which was really good. If you guys haven't watched it, it's a great, great series. Um, another one I think will be really interesting for for anyone here who hasn't watched it yet, especially because we're into tech. We're talking about AI and this dystopian type of stuff is uh, a Black Mirror on uh, on Netflix. That is a wonderful series. And they had, a, I think they had, a, was it this year, maybe the end of last year, they had another season released, but uh, kind of like a, a new version of Twilight Zone. Um, uh, very, very good. And, and if you're a techie person and all the stuff we're talking about with AI and and, and the, the dark side of what it means in the future, it's very, very, very good. Yeah, um, you know, I I, I started watch, watching the uh, Black Mirror. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I think the first episode of the new season was kind of funny. And then it mm. got really dark, and I had to stop did you watching watch it. The, the old seasons, or you only started the new season? The, the, uh, no, I did watch. You know, I okay, yeah. I didn't watch all the episodes, but the I new, did watch the latest the, season. The was 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 a little on the darker side, but it was yeah. still it was it was still worth watching. I, I would I would finish it if I were. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every episode is right? different. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a couple relatable. that are very. There are a couple that are that are definitely on the darker side of it, but it was. But they were they were still there was still there was a couple good good techie ones. I'm also people probably don't know, but all the books behind me. Uh, you probably think they're architecture books and and like bin books but they're actually all sci-fi books i'm i'm actually a, a huge uh and this was i think uh the beginning of the pandemic maybe even before that i i i um i started really getting into sci-fi and so uh, I, uh can, can you of, say, the, can you show it uh, oh, this, the screen? this is this is peter hamilton's uh, uh, can you move it to the center yeah there you go yeah okay. there we go this is actually i finished this one a little while ago but um a bunch of series and stuff and so i I could go down a whole list of stuff, but there's a whole bunch. So right now, that was the one I I recently finished. Um, and then um, there's a series called The Architects. It's a British uh, author. I'm on the the third book of that. Um, um, so you know, I I spend a lot of time doing that's that's my escape from all of this stuff. Is is reading sci-fi, <laughs> believe it or not. And so yeah, I've been I've been burning through a few a few of those <laughs> for sure. Uh, and if anyone's interested in 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 the series that I've been reading, then I. I don't want to list it all down here, but I can I can definitely share that um, some of the more recent series that I, that I've read. Yeah, sure. All right. So, uh, how about you? My... Go past that. Th that's a good question. You know, I I have enjoyed the movies, uh, some movies this year, but I was really looking forward for a Dune Part Two, and it got mm. delayed until March because that was my favorite movie. Actually, it was two years ago, and I really enjoyed it. 
uh so i'm looking you know, forward it's funny, to it i haven't i haven't watched it yet because i want yeah. to read the book first so uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, i've, I'm, I've been too. waiting and i haven't uh this one of those like sci-fi books i haven't read yet and so uh, that's one of the ones i've been waiting to watch the movie because i want to read the book first so, yeah definitely so read the book yet. first um yeah. but the first chapter is so hard they introduce like 50 words to you and you have no idea what any of them mean they just <laughs> yeah, yeah. The universe, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 that's that seems to be a lot of these though they they expect you to know these random universes they generate in the beginning but then it all makes sense in time so you just got to get yeah. through it <laughs> for sure uh other than that i think from i was thinking uh, from books, I enjoyed the the books. It's been kind of for many years of uh, Robert Greene. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is uh, Mastery. Another is the, the Laws of Human Nature. He also has some podcast appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, I always get lots of uh, insights from him. So that's something I've been enjoying this year, uh, this year as well. Um, okay, the I think we're almost done here. I think we should end with uh, your projects for next year or your wish for 2024. Any kind of big projects you think you'll be working on next year uh, or what you hope is going to happen in the industry. Maybe I can start. Like I, I really was sad to miss uh, AU this year and the Bill conference has been canceled for um, in North America for 2024. So, which uh, makes me sad. I didn't attend any international conference this year, just local events. And I, I miss it. You know, I miss going to AU. So that's definitely something I'm looking forward to returning to AU next year. And I hope that Built returns or that some people start an independent conference in North America where uh, people of uh, uh, BIM and AC can go. And also, yeah, looking forward to Bill finally launch the BIM Pure platform. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I would. I'll add to that. Um, so I did. I did attend Built this year. I didn't attend AU, but I also did um, quite a bit. Uh, three or four, I think, in-person sessions or spe speeches. You know, speaking uh, gigs again. Um, that's the first time since really the, the start of the pandemic that started doing those again and that that I really enjoy that um so I did it built there's an AA conference and there's another smaller conference that that I spoke at and so I'm hoping the plan for 24 is to to definitely do more in-person stuff um not a lot of people know but uh just before the pandemic um I hosted a um a DIY Dynamo day which DIY Dynamo was my course I created back in 2018 or something maybe more I don't know, maybe 18 I don't know but <laughs> it was actually the January before COVID so I guess in theory it was probably during COVID, right? Because COVID was kind of around that point. Um, but um, but uh, it was before the community membership started. It was kind of in between it, and and the thought was to do a lot more of those. And that was um, it was a, a, a one one day um, eight eight hour in person session. Um, and I hosted it here in Connecticut. Some people flew in, some people drew drove in, and we had 10, 12 people. And basically, it was a live version of the course. Um, and it, it was awesome. And we we had lunch, we had dinner afterwards, and it was really good. So. Um, I'm I'm hoping maybe uh, 24 is the year we start bringing some of that stuff back too. Um, maybe with the 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 lack of built, you know, maybe there's some some voids that need to be filled anyways. And so um, uh, we should do I'm, it. I'll I'll just drive there. It's like a they, seven hours yeah, drive. We're, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna be halfway. We'll meet in Maine or, or Vermont. Or something Let's like that. do a conference. What do you guys <laughs> yeah. think in the chat? Like, do you want a conference? With do it. <laughs> As well, you guys can fly fly to Maine or or, or 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 Vermont. It'll be in between, so I only have to drive three hours. You don't have to drive three hours, and we'll find some. some yeah, there are, there are no somewhere. good airports, though. You know. No, that's true. You got to drive a little bit, so we'll we'll figure that one out. But <laughs> that that's definitely one of the things um, I definitely want to um, uh, it, put, push towards a little bit more in twenty four is 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 taking advantage of the fact that we can all see each other again. Yeah. Do you plan to attend uh, AU next year? I think we should have some sort of a BIM content creator booth. Yeah, it's undecided. Um, but uh, <laughs> but with with the with the if, if built does not happen, which is not happening now, I'm thinking it's it's looking more and more like I, I probably will. If mm -hmm. if if the uh, if F1 is going on at the same time again, I'm not sure if I want to do that. It's, that did not sound I don't about. like. I've heard it might not be in Vegas. I've heard yeah. uh, Nashville and I've heard San Diego. 
possible. Every, everyone's everyone's picking locations for our conference, by the way. So far, we've got London, <laughs> Hawaii, and Denver. <laughs> All great places. <laughs> Hawaii is a little longer than a three-hour drive, though. I could tell you. That. Yeah, but someone said London. I think that's it even further again, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, awesome. but that, I mean, London, it's a five-hour flight from uh, the East Coast. So it's not that bad. Yeah, yeah, not too bad. We got, direct, um, we got direct flights and good with that. <laughs> uh, what about you, Gavin? Any kind of uh, wish or upcoming projects for 2024? Yeah, um, I actually have to start noting them down because I started bouncing around in my head because there's so much stuff going on. I mean, I know I'm, I'm getting married next year, so I'm sure a lot of those projects won't happen <laughs> next year, even though if I want them to. Um, I definitely want to get more into courses. Um, there's a lot of things I could package up more neatly than what I do on YouTube, I think. So I've recognized that. Probably programming is where I want to focus a lot of my education. Um, I'd love to do some workshops for universities where I am. So I've started talking to a few people to try and just get a segue for the graduates to programming because it's a really unnatural step to take. Um, but I think when people see it, they often understand it because um, I want to find more programmers in the industry that you know stay in the industry as well. They don't just leave the software development companies, hopefully. Um, but I guess beyond that too, um, personally, I'll be trying to learn more about C Sharp and web development. Um, I've almost finished the CS50 break-in course, but I've been just doing a lot of free learning on the side as well. Um, if anyone's wondering, I don't think it'll be coming to the channel anytime soon because I'm only just learning it. So um, probably don't wait for me to teach you that. Um, but uh, personally, one thing is um, where I've been working, I've been developing these tools and starting to scale them, but we've, we've had a merger recently, which has brought in a lot of new users to the firm. and. Uh, I think like next year will be a really formative year for a lot of the solutions I've developed to scale. So I really look forward to, you know, just growing the user base around me that I work Seeing with. Seeing how as much well. they break. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm pretty careful. I build a lot of exit conditions into my tools. So, um, but you're right. It, it's it, you learn the bugs through the users when they use them, right? Yeah. Like you can only troubleshoot yourself so much. So um, that's <laughs> that's the fun part. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, my... PyRevit is like really easy to deploy, so you don't have to run like an exe again or anything like that. It's a yeah. pretty on my process. part. Uh, I'm torn that I want to learn programming. I do know a little bit of Python. I can write some things, but mm -hmm. I also think I'm already spending enough time in front of a computer yeah. and yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'm just lacking time, really speaking. And I've started working with some freelancers who are giving me a hand on uh, uh, Dynamo scripts and even some mm -hmm. Python and C sharp scripting. So that's uh, probably the route well, I'm going. On. Happy to help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it, it's a commitment. Like you definitely wouldn't want to do it if you don't want screen time because yeah, programming is like all screen time. Yeah, I spend yeah. most of my day looking That's at right. Python next to Revit. So it's like double screen time. <laughs> so, and I think it's a pathway as well. Like I can't imagine how I could, you know, become an architect holistically with mm -hmm. the, the path that I'm following. It's really a different pathway through the industry. Yeah. Um, but I really hope to keep it connected to, to the firm and to companies and contextualize it. I, I could go to work for a software developer, of course, but you lose that immediate connection with, with the users, I think. So, so it's just a commitment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on my side, I think one of my wishes to have a bit more time for different hobbies than spending time on the computer, doing some woodwork stuff like that, using a hammer, <laughs> but I generally speaking, it's always a wish that I have, but I, I tend to lack times. You know how it is, Jeff, with the two young kids, it's just the, the amount I of do. time. I do. What, what, I mean, one of my, you know, I, I, I love fishing. I'm, I'm a big fisherman. And uh, so one of the great things, obviously having kids, you know, make, makes it a lot harder, especially in the beginning when they're much younger. Uh, but my son is five now, and my daughter's two and a half. And so he's of the age now where I can start taking him with me more. I mean, I, t I took him with me quite a bit, but it's, it's more, it's more of actual fishing when I take him with me. And so, so uh, I think last year, the end of last year, or the beginning of uh, for 18 months ago, I think I, I got a, 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 a bigger boat that he can fit on. So it's a, a, a power boat and we go around and stuff. So that we definitely, I definitely did a lot more of that this year, which is great. Um, and getting him out and, you know, definitely makes it easier as they get a little older and they can do those things. It was a lot harder when they were, uh, yeah, young. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, all I, right. I might give us that time, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Or I might look at Revit and go, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> yes. I think we'll uh, we'll slowly bring this to a, a close. I'm looking at the chat and a lot of people say Denver for uh, 
Come we just, for, for some reason, we got a lot of people from Denver in the chat, I think is what it really is. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I like the idea of Montreal. A great place. Denver, Denver's a beautiful place, though. Yeah. I, I actually do. I do very, very much enjoy Montreal the, the, the couple of times I have been there. So it's not. Well, the only thing is I think I, I need to renew my passport, so I can't do that yet. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I got to get on that. <laughs> uh okay so where can we find your stuff i think actually in the video description uh i've added a link gavin you still have you have a, a course platform right yeah it's on my youtube channel just everything's okay. on my youtube channel go to my page i'll see guru you'll find all the links sarah you don't have to shout them all out so okay <laughs> okay all right and, and jeff i i think i added a link to your community as well so uh awesome. we're all good and then of course you can at twitter or x right you can <laughs> add the revit kid and then obviously here on youtube but definitely Head on over to community.mafterdark.com to to check that part out. Uh, we have an office hour on Friday morning, so if you want to join and see the office hour right away, go check it out. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. Let's, let me just uh, bring something up quickly. Uh, so once again, I'm launching this uh, new course, Heroic Families. I'm really right up about it. I've been working on this course for so long, and I'm happy that it's uh, finally be going uh, to be going to be released for the public. And you can sign up. It's going to be released in early February next year. So you'll learn more. I plan to post a lot about the kind of uh, wild families I've been building in the last couple of years. Uh, the link uh, for this is in the video description. The course is called Herrick Families. Release in early 2024. All right, back to you guys. This was uh, really cool. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having thanks for us on. Us. Yeah. This was this was very relaxing for me as a as a, stream, <laughs> as a streamer myself. This was nice, <laughs> so I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, what I like about the evening session is the the, the little drinks. I typically yes. try not, not to bring them <laughs> in the afternoon. So it's something I enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> I think I said it last year, Nicholas. As long as you have me on, I'm happy to come every year. <laughs> yeah, like that. We've been let's do it then once again, you guys. I think, third year uh, we've done this right, but at the same time too, if you ever want someone else to be featured for the end of the year. No hard feelings. There's a lot of people out there that deserve to be shared with, with more people. So yeah, but I, I like the idea of having traditions. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Go for yeah, it. Why not? <laughs> Somebody in the chat a long time ago asked about the hat. I this is not for sale. This is actually from 2009. If you guys recognize, if you've been following me for a long time, this was one of the huh. original logos for Kit. and I, I thought I'd wear it today, but no, unfortunately, it's not for sale. I'm sorry. I don't. I couldn't even find this graphic if I tried uh, <laughs> to, to even make it again for you guys. So no, this is a. It was available at one point in time, but no, it's 2000, but, 2009, I think, 2010 is when, when I bought this, made this hat. <laughs> do you have a store with clothing? I do, actually. If you, if you head you on over to shop.bimafterdark.com, um, uh -huh. uh, you can get a t-shirt. So this is a community t-shirt and then the uh, the lock. I lock do have noob, your shirt with a lock. Noob, noob expert shirt is <laughs> Yeah, there. I do um, have there's, this one. There's, there's some shirts, there's some hoodies. So yeah, you guys can check that out. I I think I might have put like a dollar markup, so it's as cheap as I could get it. So I'm sorry if the prices are high, but it's just print on demand is extremely in, in, in challenging. So, uh, but if you're interested, definitely head on over there. There's I think they have this graphics there, and then there's the the noob expert one with the locks, um, and there's some mugs and some stuff like that. So yeah, unfortunately, this is not there. If you guys wanted some some OG it's pretty cool uh, Revit kit <laughs> stuff, yeah, you um, need to it's have usually, a bit... it's, usually, it's usually over on the shelf back there. But I thought today yeah. I would put it on and, and I... wear it. I think you need a vintage collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wish I had it. I had most of it, but I, I have some. I have some old stuff. I have some stuff. This is the oldest, though. This is 2009. This is, this is original. So if you're watching this in like 300 years and you found it in a shop, you got it. It's the hat. That's right. That's right. It's the hat. Dude, 2009. So that's been like 15 years. That's pretty yeah. crazy. That was the, yeah, this was the first year that I started the blog. I made this. So yeah, 2009. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's uh, put this to a close. Uh, thanks to everybody in the, in the chat for listening in. As always, thanks for your great interaction and questions. And thanks to uh, Kevin and Jeff. So, yeah, that's thanks, it. Man. So, thanks for happy having Christmas, us. Happy New Year, yep. and see you next year. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, Cheers. everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, see you.